They call themselves the Bad Voodoo Platoon. Bad Voodoo! And they're being sent back to Iraq to be part of the surge. A lot of these new guys don't know what they're getting into. They will discover that the war has changed. Yep. We're used to kicking in doors, taking the fight to the enemy. And they must fight new frustrations. Got hit by an IED. We're waiting to get blown up and not allowed to fight back. Battled through their fatigue. The night is gonna be a heavy night. We're just running ourselves into the ground. Dear Heavenly Father. And conquer their fears. Lord, we come to you to watch over us and all these convoys. Tonight. Oh, I dig. The inside story of Bad Voodoo's War. This is the U.S. military's Joint Forces Training Center, Camp Shelby, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I came here to meet a platoon of National Guard soldiers who are getting ready to be deployed to Iraq. The first person I met was the acting platoon leader, Sergeant Toby Nunn. And then you crawl, you get down. And then you get back up the whole time, you run in place. The platoon sergeant is the father figure. I'm responsible for the care and welfare of, you know, the 30 guys underneath me. One, two, crawl! It's May 2007. One, 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 two! In just a few weeks, Sergeant Nunn must have the 30 men in his platoon ready for combat. One, two, sprawl. They'll be going in at the peak of the surge. One, two, sprawl. This is going to be my third real combat deployment, my ninth overall deployment. Get him up. But I never thought of myself as a warrior. I'm just a kid from the bush up in Canada. I grew up in a large logging center. I'm a little guy. I wanted to do something with my mind more than with my hands. So I came to the United States hoping to get a little break on college. And somewhere along the way, I realized that paying for college by yourself is expensive. So I joined the Army, started off as a young private, enjoying the infantry. Kosovo kicked off, and I got sent to the Balkans. The right place to learn about what humanity really has to hold, both good and evil. And then uh, I joined the Strikers. And that's where I went to Operation Iraqi Freedom 1 and 2 with the Tomahawks. Then I came to California, and uh, shortly thereafter, got a letter in the mail. Going back. Toby's platoon calls itself the Bad Voodoo Platoon. Bad Voodoo! And they are not typical National Guard soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, 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 ooh. Almost all of the men are prior active duty. They're not weekend warriors. What they're looking for is that this is the direction, all right? So yell at the three Ds, I'll yell them back to you. Watch that. Mainly just shoot I'm gonna up, Sarge. All right, we, we gotta watch our cussing. Sure. How about we're gonna decisively engage and destroy enemy targets and combatants? That, that sounds like a plan. Most are highly trained infantrymen. We're going to decisively engage right. enemy targets and combatants. And many have already served multiple tours to Iraq. Special Shaw found out that some of us had been selected to go. He wasn't. And he called me up. He was like, hey, Sarn, you know, do you think I could come along? I'm going to show you how it's done. Um, uh, he explained that some of these guys are his friends. He's like, they're my brothers. I want to go. So Jason Shaw volunteered to go back to Iraq. Enemy 9 o'clock, 100 meters! Enemy 9 o'clock, 100 meters! Let's go! 
Hi. This is my third tour to Iraq. In 2003, we did the initial push into Iraq from Kuwait all the way up into Baghdad. We stayed there uh, for a while. We called it Hotel Hell. <laughs> 2005 and went back. Did personal security detachment and Baju Balad to Crit and Samora. Five cities. There's been a lot that's happened. A lot to deal with. Makes you not care about anything. I did counseling at the VA, so I saw a psychiatrist and psychologist. They said I had PTSD, which obviously a lot of people have. I'm the best gunner there is, son. A lot of these new guys who've never been over there before don't know what they're getting into. So I figured if I've been there one, two, three times before, you know, there's something I can do for the good of the cause. So I'd like to go back again and maybe do one more tour. This is it. <laughs> so. Hey, make sure when you get that first straight on target, you shoot a little low. Sergeant Nunn's the smartest guy I know. I feel really safe going with him. More than anybody I've ever been with or wanted to go with. There you go, there you go. Stop shooting the lift and start hitting the target. He gets things done the way they need to be done. Enemy, the He's bad voodoo, you know? You can't really mess with voodoo, so. I got a nickname back in the Balkans do an event where a Muslim and a Christian were arguing, and they felt like I might not be neutral. And I told them I didn't care either way what religion they were, and it had nothing to do with mine. I told them I was voodoo. Yeah. <laughs> so since then, this nickname has kind of followed me. And uh, when the guys were voting on what they wanted to name the platoon, someone nominated bad voodoo. It was real nice that they chose that and real flattering for me, but they really are. They live up to it. Are you watching <laughs> Visitors, Mr. Kids, watch It's kind of hard not to care about these guys. I got this wonderful family, 32 guys. Come on, honey, let's go. Get safety briefing. We got safety briefing. I'm excited to be part of their experience, but uh, I'm also a little disappointed that it, that's coming at the expense of my own family. Get in there, Jeffrey. Oh. Oh. Toby's family back in California was growing just as he was being sent to Iraq. His wife, Reagan, was four months pregnant. What's in there? Baby. And there's a lot of excitement with that. You know, I, I feel like I'm being negligent in my duties. Last time I came back, my son, he asked me not to go anymore. How's that? Not bad. You got up there pretty quick. He told me, I'm right here. Focus. You got stuff to do. So I was like, right. You are my focus, and uh, I will stay right here. And then I made a liar out of myself. You need to be humble. That's all it's about. When my son was just a, a baby, I got a, a tickle me elbow. This is how I rolled last time. That's <laughs> great. That is my little piece of home. That little elbow has been in more countries than the majority of guys in platoon can spell. I'm an American soldier. I'm a warrior and a member of a team. I'm a warrior and a member of a team. Training was over and the men were headed to Iraq. I stand ready to deploy. They asked me if we could work together to capture their experiences. The enemies of the United States of America. The enemies of the United States of America. You should record that. Oh. You're not recording. As I did on an earlier film, I set up a virtual embed. So you can mount it on the dashboard to okay. the side, on the wind. I mean, you can mount this thing anywhere. Okay. which involves giving cameras to the soldiers. It's up to you to tell me what's working for you. And establishing a close, two-way working relationship while they're in Iraq. Camp control manual, night shot on. Yeah, there we go. See, the green thing. The soldiers would be the storytellers, not just subjects. And then you can just do a quick little... I told them we would tell the story of their yeah. war through their eyes. 
wherever it took them. There it is. The silver and white bird of destiny. Tell me about your going away at the first time on block leave. Block leave, by the way, is when you get to go home before you go to before you go overseas. We got to spend nine days at home. So did Veronica come down and spend time with you? Yeah, she did. I saw her at the airport. She almost knocked me out by jumping on me. Had to save my life. And uh, leaving, I, I cried. I cried. Very sad. Hey, you didn't cry yesterday too much. I actually did. I oh, you left did? and went beside the building because y'all went outside. Are you serious? Is that what you went outside? Yeah, dude. I was upset. It's hard. It's the, it's the hardest deployment I've ever had to do. I'm not really looking forward to this. Just don't want to do it again, man. You wonder how many times you're going to, you know, luck's going to be on your side. Cool. Oh. Yeah. It's an awesome responsibility that I'm being charged with. I got 30 guys. The smallest thing that ever happens, you know, is just it's gonna be hard. By midsummer, tapes from Iraq were streaming in. Toby and his guys were a couple of weeks into their tour. That's the uh, north end of the crate right there. And they had their cameras up and running. Saddam Hussein's hometown. Uh, believe it or not, this is farmland. <laughs> not quite the uh, irrigated green pastures of America, but still pretty good. Iraqi checkpoint compound. There's uh, my dash cam, uh, which is uh, filming me uh, inside the cab. There's my uh, POV cam filming the road in front of me. The bad voodoo platoon were spending a lot of time on these roads. The army had based them at Camp Virginia in Kuwait, just south of Iraq, and assigned them a primary mission of convoy security. The mission of our platoon is to secure military and non-military elements to go into Iraq. We pick them up in Kuwait, and we escort them to their destination within the theater of Iraq. All right, so here we are, getting ready to cross the border, leaving the wire. Wherever that equipment personnel need to go, that's where we take it. Today we're uh, taking a convoy of tankers. The surge has brought so many forces and so much equipment back into the theater. It takes a lot to get it to where it needs to be. Roger, on a PFD, looks like there's a southbound convoy coming down. Over. The convoy mission that Bad Voodoo leads take them all over Iraq, all the way from Kuwait up towards the Turkish border. They can be on the road for weeks at a time. For combat infantrymen like these, being stuck in vehicles was frustrating. A lot of our guys don't like this mission. I'm one of them. We're used to having our boots on the ground, kicking in doors, taking the fight to the enemy, as opposed to having the fight brought to us and just kind of dealing with it. Yeah, nothing but gas tanks down top. Yeah. Push them off the road. Push them off the road. Get off the road. The guys have been joking, you know, this is not convoy security, it's a uh, convoy survival. It's hotter than before. Get on the hard ball, get on the hard ball. Sit, slow down, slow down, slow down. We're 
taking a lot more action. We're being attacked more. God. The focus of the enemy is to shut down some of these logistical lines. Oh, it's blowing, it's blowing. Hey, come on, okay, pull this vehicle back, pull this vehicle back. And it doesn't take much to slow us down. We're very limited by our avenues of movement. The government uh, that is within, you know, Iraq itself is been able to dictate things to us that we don't have the freedom of movement that we had before when, you know, we were calling the shots. Among the Iraqis, the bad voodoo soldiers must work with are the police and highway patrol. The roads that they travel every day are strewn with checkpoints manned by Iraqis. <laughs> Toby and his men count on these Iraqis to help keep them safe. We're, we're from Bravo Company 160th. We're uh, a small element uh, that represents a large element. And, uh, you know, we're here to have this dialogue so that, you know, we can better the relationship. Well, I told myself last time I wanted to train the Iraqis the best that I possibly could because it was my ticket home. That we could turn this over to them and we could allow them to do it. it it is important that you know we have a better relationship. But here I am, three years later, saying, will the Iraqi security forces enforce anything out there? When you have an IED and you're trying to cord it off to block. Every time I, I talk to these guys, you know, my, my trust meter it isn't reading in the green all the time. You know, you go through these checkpoints, how many of these guys are counting the vehicles, taking notations of, you know, how we're doing things. It's not that I think you're the enemy. I think you just might have some unsavory elements within you. It's a different military climate. Back in the day, you get intel, black Mercedes, pacing people, gathering intelligence. If that dude rolled up on us, we would just cap him. Man, problem solved. We're rolling around in armored vehicles, waiting to get blown up, and uh, not allowed to fight back. We're here to do a job, and we just want to do it. And when our, we're getting blown up and they're not doing anything about it, it kind of asses us up. The tapes take about a week to get from Iraq to our office here in New Hampshire. So we're on the outskirts of Baghdad. With IM and phone calls, though, I'm typically aware of what's happening to them as it unfolds over there. What's something that's, you know, weighing on you more than... We're always talking about what's going on and how they can capture it on tape. What about being on the road all the time? And like our non-stop missions. Like Not just what's happening in the field, but what they are thinking and feeling. This mission is by far a lot, a lot different than any other one I've had in different ways. Um, it's not combat anymore. It's, it's like, I want to say a game. <laughs> 2003 was totally different. Just received some of these pictures. This shows the height of the combat. 2003 was all out. You saw on the news combat. And we have some fresh pictures of the fighting for the Baghdad airport. During the invasion of Iraq, Jason Shaw was part of the battle for the Baghdad airport. The hangars that they had to take one by one. Our brother got hit by a tank over there. But it is clear this is about as much activity as we have seen. So we pulled out the javelin gunners and we started getting shot at by the tanks from both sides of the overpass. And we blew up all three. For his actions, Shaw was awarded the Silver Star, the military's third highest award for valor. I just turned 18. I'm 22 now. 
young. I've had six of my good friends die. One of my really good friends passed away, he had a baby about three months before he died, and uh, got to see her once. <laughs> and uh, now I'm Uncle Jason, so I moved to California just to pretty much help out and try to get everything back together. So I don't want to have to go through that again. It's really hard to deal with, so it's not going to happen this time. I won't let it happen this time. When I lost all my buddies, I just kind of lost hope. I used to be kind of religious. That last deployment totally made me think otherwise. You know, you pray all the time to keep everybody safe, and then something happens like that. I don't know. I really think it's pointless in my mind. So it's kind of sad, but uh, it's the way it goes. <laughs> Everybody else has noticed a big change in my personality. I have a really bad temper with things. I get angry very, very easily. I'm just hoping that when I come back from this deployment, I don't do that to my girlfriend or friends or anything like that. But going out every single day gets really stressful. You could have five missions or so, six, nothing happened go a month without anything happening, and all of a sudden... Hey, get the Got hit by an IED. Where they at? Where they at? We're on a regular mission. Came over the radio, IED, IED. Looked over in front of us, a huge cloud of smoke. Right there. Right, hurry up. There's the fire. Covering the road. There's where it was right there. Go through it. First thing I thought is nobody made it out of that. Here. I thought for sure everybody was burning up. I thought it was the vehicle. Right. Right. The trunk blew off. But as we got closer, we noticed it was just the trunk. Blew off the whole back end of his trunk. Thank God everybody's all right. Look at this. Can't help it. Blew straight through the back, not a scratch on one of these Joes. Mother. Lucky. With one of their vehicles disabled, the soldiers are under orders to sit and wait for KBR, Kellogg, Brown, and Root, a private contracting firm, to arrive and recover them. Right now we're waiting for KBR pickup. Nice hot day. It's about 130 right now. It's only like 10.30 a.m. Hot as heck. Sit and wait game now. I've been here now eight and a half hours. KBR has still not shown up, so we took it on our own selves to get ourselves out of here. After eight and a half hours of standing out here in the zone, it's now almost dark. They had waited all day for KBR until a passing U.S. military convoy came to their rescue. Luckily, this convoy came by. It's helping us out. That would be the old tire. Done. Gone. We're ready to roll. We are rolling with half of a Humvee. It's a pretty scary day. It's kind of scary to know that all your friends could be up there, you know, getting blown up by IED or EFP. I can't tell you guys when that happened. I really thought I was done with this crap. It's really scary not knowing what's going on. So, you know, take every day like it's your last and try to make it as it is. When I was in Iraq last time, we had a soldier named Sergeant Jake DeMand. 
great guy, father of two of his own boys and then a little girl that he had adopted. He was one of my, my friends. And uh, he cared for people in a way that, you know, not many people ever have, especially with what it took for him to leave this earth for some of us to stay. I haven't talked about that very often, so. Guy, uh, guy took 18 rounds on the ramp of a striker, let out on the scene so everybody else could get on a striker. I make people do stuff like that. 90 seconds, eight magazines. He's a real hero. I make people know that, you know? I couldn't help but think about these two little boys and this little girl that will never really know what uh, their father experienced over there. And I, I don't mean the, the harshness, I mean the, the sweetness, how he cared for his guys and was always good for a laugh and a, a great broiled salmon. And you know, th these are the stories that are important. The guys, the face that actually goes out and does what people can't imagine. And just a regular guy. We are people. And people forget that. So what are you gonna do for your birthday today, Tom? Huh? I'm gonna drink this, the whole thing. I'm gonna celebrate. I'll talk to you later, guys. <laughs> I need privacy. <laughs> Combat just kind of something that happens on the battlefield. They don't want to want to know what you get somebody for their 75th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> the fellowship with the other guys, that's really what the experience is. Whatever, dude. <laughs> worried about you. You'll never find friends like you've been to war with. This is you last night. Let me have a drink. You guys are left me. I'm not gonna go to jail without you guys. I hate you guys. Somebody you trust with everything, your life, which is the the biggest thing there is. Oh, look at me. I'm the American fun boy. I did Sergeant Baker's schnitzel von Hafenswaffen. <laughs> That's why I volunteered to go this time. I do it for the guys I'm with, you know, not for anybody else, you know. Now it's getting old. Everybody needs to come home. I'm having an awesome time. It's great. I don't like the whole reason that we're over here. I love Iraq. Not much going on out here again. Nothing goes on here except for when we blow up. That's about it. It's ridiculous. I hate it. <laughs> you know, when are they going to start bringing guys home? You know, I think it's totally pointless. As the weeks and months rolled on, it became obvious how much the grind of their mission was wearing down Toby and his men. It's about five in the morning, and uh, we are getting ready to go out on what we like to call a lettuce and tomato run. Uh, it's our smart-ass way of saying, you know, carrying nothing of military significance you know, a lot of times you're taking stuff that you know an American soldier will never touch or see, and you're just doing it to hook up some, you know, private contractor. It's frustrating times to constantly be doing the stuff. All right, we'll be, we'll be right there in a minute. The leadership above us, they, they don't grasp, you know, the, the big picture. All they see is we got to get this many trucks from point A to point B. And they don't think about, you know, what effect it has on the vehicles, what effects that, that has on the soldiers. You're driving on the road for hours and hours and hours and days. It's very monotonous. You try to be hyper aware. Hey, uh, tell your tail gun truck and, uh, 
eyes on the rest of your gun trucks. The, the black Mercedes pulled in at the southbound lane and has kind of following us up a little bit. And we're going to battle hand them off to you so you can maintain eyes on. Constantly looking at every possible little thing. Is this guy trying to kill me? Is this guy pacing me? Is he counting how many men I got? There's that white Toyota truck. It takes a toll on you. When I get done, I, would, I just want to close my eyes. And my body is not physically fatigued, but my eyes are fatigued. And when you're moving large numbers of personnel and equipment around, you don't get a lot of rest. The people that are planning the mission, they look at a map of what it's going to take to get from point A to point B and how long it's going to be. But they don't take in consideration what could happen on the road. It was clear what was making Bad Voodoo's mission so long. Attacks like this one at a base in Kirkuk, where the convoy was briefly resting and refueling, could keep them trapped in place for hours. It's code red right now. As soon as we were leaving the tent, an explosion went off, which means probably indirect fire, and then the alarms went off. Code red means everyone needs to get inside and take cover. Unless it goes down to yellow, then we're not going to be leaving. It's getting worse. What should take a couple of hours ends up being an entire day. So we eat when we can, sleep when we can, drink fluids by the gallon, and hope to stay awake. There's a challenge, though, to drinking fluids by the gallon. Guys come down with urinary tract infections because they've been holding it in for so long. Kidney stones because they've been drinking too much Red Bull. We're just running ourselves into the ground. For me, that's been the hardest part to manage. Worried about my guys, and I'm always constantly looking at what they're doing and making sure that they're getting rest and eating well. And right now, I'm out here <laughs> talking to you while they're inside sleeping because I can't sleep, I can't rest. You know, this time is a lot different for me. You know, last time I had a battle guy I could look to and share and confide in, and this time, I got you, I guess, my, my camera. Folks at home, maybe you'll understand, but I won't feel your, your compassion and sympathy and empathy. By the fall, messages from Toby were getting a bit more sporadic and unpredictable. Their missions were getting longer. In late September, Toby sent word that they were heading north again. He said that things were only getting hotter and that their odds of getting hit were getting worse. Oh, here we are, it's about uh, 2.30 in the morning. The 2nd of October, we have been on the road for a while. We are currently at um, Anaconda, or other known as uh, the Balad Air Base, a uh, long ways away from uh, home. Uh, we just got another change of mission, and we are going to go even further north. Uh, we're going to go into the Tikrit region. 
I wasn't too excited to get this change of mission. The stretch of road between Anaconda and Spikers, known as ID Alley, it's probably the, the one of the worst stretches of road in theater. Hey, Bob, seven. Every time that we've taken it, the people in front of us and the people behind us have both been struck, uh, and always with casualties. Roger, I took a good look at the flare all the way down Milton. Uh, the, the good news is the route clearance team did go north. Uh, the bad news is it was seven hours ago and we were the only people going north tonight. So uh, make sure all your people understand that we really need to pay very, very close attention tonight. It's about 1.30 in the morning. We're all the way into Cree right now. We'll be leaving here in a little bit. And it uh, looks like we're going to be uh, going this route alone again. Hey, Ball, who's, who's rep driving for? There were two Air Force airmen driving the vehicle in front of me. Bird Dog, with your seven. Bird Dog and this kid named Rev. Hey, tell Rev uh, we really need him to pray a little more, all right? Rev, the kid that is actually driving, is uh, very spiritual, very religious, leads us in prayer for each mission that we go on. Here we are, it's 4.30 in the afternoon. We drove down from Tikrit early this morning. We're just north of Baghdad, Bob called Taji. We um, are very fortunate. We were the only people on the road last night other than a route clearance team. And uh, they got hit, we didn't. You know, we've been real lucky the last three days. The last three days, you know, I'm mentally and emotionally prepared for the worst. So when we got into our tents, you know, this morning, I, I just, you know, I don't want to show too much emotion in front of the guys, but I just, like, I want to go hug each one of them and be like, ah, made it, you know. Well, I'm going to get some rest. Um, I'm tired. I got to go out in a couple more hours, and tonight's probably going to be a, a tough haul. So, I'll sign off with that, and see you guys soon. Tonight is going to be a heavy night. Tonight's going to be the, one of those nights you guys earn your money off. The potential is ten times higher than it normally is. It's already pretty high, right? All right, who here has an extra cat, combat action tourniquet? Who has an extra one? Well, everybody should, right? See the requirements. All right, you got one in your eye pack, you have an extra. Go ahead and take that extra one out now and put it on your door side appendage. Put it on your leg, all right? Put it above the knee, below the hip, all right? Don't tighten it down, all right? That way, if we come to you, the chances are, if you're going to get hit in your truck, it's going to be on your door side, right? be hitting that lower appendage, it's going to be knocking you off. The sooner you can get that tourniquet tight, the sooner you are, A, to save your life from a moral bleed out, and B, saving the chance of better quality of life when we get you out of there in the safety, check? Right, I'm not saying it's to scare you guys, I'm just trying to keep it real. All right? Hey, uh, come on in. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this evening, especially tonight, to watch over us and all these convoys, no matter where they travel, to watch over us. We ask you to keep your hand over us. 
Keep us protected. Keep us awake. Don't let us get complacent. Keep our eyes out there. Let us see everything that you see. Lord, give your strength to the C2s and the gun trucks for everything they do is good. And all good comes to you. Lord, we ask you to be with us as we travel these roads and as we push up north. Lord, we ask you just, uh, just, to, just to keep your kind hand over our families back home. Make sure they know that we're okay and just to keep their worries away. Just wash them away, Lord. And we ask you just to keep your eyes. Keep over, so let's have the name be pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, Bert, uh, don't forget, we got a bridge coming up. We got to have the ship for There had been some damage to a bridge. We had a temporary bridge in place, but we only had it over one lane. We had to share the, you know, the northbound lane. We were southbound. Right, let's see what we got here. Let's see what we got here. A group passed in the opposite direction, and uh, we waited for them to come over. Bird, uh, you see that median? We jumped over to the northbound lane. And we were just coming off that bridge and getting ready to come up to speed. When, uh... Hello, hello. Hi, this is ID. Uh, we have an ID dead, LBC. Let's go. Uh, slow, slow down, slow down. We're done. Give me a standing. Pull up left, pull up left. Voodoo 7, Voodoo 7, bird dog. ID left. Can you roll too? That's from Negative. The I'm We're just scanning right this now. This is not rolling. I can't see. The smoke was heavy. The vehicle is burning. We have an ID dead. Hey, boss. Hey, bird dog. Look for okay. secondary stop. Look for secondary. Right. 5461, this is Bravo 27 Golf. Be advised, I just had an IED dead. I'm about 10 meters short of the uh, 22, uh, correction 32 Alpha. Kevin, this is 1 Alpha. I'm coming up on your six. Negative, not at this time. We have no injuries to report. Bird dog and Rev. They made it through, luckily. But how am I looking to the right? It went off right underneath them. Yeah, get the lights going again, Bird dog, so we can advance. Blew the whole ass of their vehicle off. You're trying to figure out what's debris, shrapnel, what's not, because an ID is typically an initiator for a greater action. Bird dog, get them lights back on now, that thing you're showing me on the bridge. It's to sucker us into another event. They're coming. What the f is that? Beat a complex attack, a secondary device. Dude, keep, keep looking at that and tell me what you think it is, bud. The biggest thing is you, you want to maintain that calm. I've got to look for them shooting as well as scan every inch of ground that I possibly can to find out if there is secondary devices. That looks like, uh, I want to say like two PVC pipes sticking up. Yeah. They about, uh, does it look like two or three feet apart? Yeah, but what could it be? There's a uh, uh, the still want to go like that. Yeah, but I, I think that's a secondary. They didn't just put one bomb, they put many. But we knew where they come from. The bomb had been placed in the road, in a pothole, and someone had just put that out. Because the time from that element coming northbound 
and us getting across that single lane bridge going southbound was 10 to 15 minutes at the most. All right, the Army vehicle descends the bridge. The bomb had blown up right at an Iraqi police checkpoint, meaning that the people at the checkpoint are the ones that emplaced it. Here we are, 4 October. We just got hit by an ID. I want to point out the blast hole, but if I get you to come at this angle, I want you to see that there's an Iraqi checkpoint right behind us. It's parts of an uh, old artillery from Crown. They put shrapnel in the ground in this pothole. People don't understand what shrapnel really is. This is like a spearhead coming through you, coming at you at 50 miles an hour. And, you know, when it hits your vehicle in an explosion, you know, and just showers and sprays, it's like going through a hailstorm. That's probably the stuff that's right there that blew it up. The warrior in you is telling you, go over there and whack every single one of them. Engage them. Let them know that you know that they're the enemy. But then, you know, the, the leader and politician in you is saying, this is not going to help the cause. This is not a, it's not going to win their hearts and minds. You know, I understand. You know, this is their country. They don't want to see Sergeant Nunn and his bad booted wheels of death rolling through their backyard every day. I got it. The secondary devices did not go off, so we were very fortunate. And, uh, instead of shooting at the Iraqi checkpoint that blew us up, I, I gave him a little smile and a wave, and I even saluted them, you know, so that perhaps they knew that I knew. And uh, it didn't work, so touche. In late October of 2007, Toby came home to California on a 15-day leave for the birth of his baby daughter. <laughs> for me to come home and be with my wife as we have our, our little girl, you know, it's just amazing. But in the days we spent filming him, Toby had a hard time relaxing. All this joy and you know overwhelming sensation is going to end abruptly because I have to go back. They just throw up a little bit. Too much of that. Mom's I'm milk. a baby. I'm gonna do that. Too much mom's there is guilt. You know, I have two sons and a daughter here. I have 34 sons there. Oh, it's, it's my little girl right here. It's my little baby girl. It's such a double-edged sword. You having a hard time with the milk there, wild child? It really pulls at you and separates you. Trying to flip that switch is very, very hard. Because they are still in danger. Huh? I'm still responsible. You know, and that's not going to end till everyone's back here and it's over. Toby and Jason Shaw both returned from leave in uh, mid-November. Well, it was good. It was, uh, got to see the girlfriend for a while. Everything was being real rocky. Everything was getting real rocky before I went home. So. Deployments 
had a big impact on our, my relationship. I'm not liking it at all, at all. So. It's hard on the both of us, because I always have to worry about what's going on back at home, or at least I think I do, and she's always having to worry about if she's going to lose me the next day. Everything's pretty much gone downhill. Right now, we're not together anymore. We're trying to take a break and take it easy, and hopefully everything works out for the best. By Christmas, the Bad Voodoo Platoon had been deployed for more than six months. All right, so stockings should be uh, one for everyone, right? Right now, we're at the halfway point. Are you the only person here? Yeah, everyone's in the, the mid-tour slump. Somebody promoted you to special. <laughs> so maybe Santa did come. But everyone's relatively healthy. We got a bunch of bad knees and backs right now, guys busted up and broken down, but we have all our fingers, all our toes, and we still have all our Joes. Well, enjoy Christmas today. Uh, you guys have a, a down day tomorrow, unless you're doing maintenance on a vehicle. Cool? And then the following day, we go to, we go to Cedar. Check? Okay. On the platoon mission. The men are still running convoy security missions throughout Iraq. I'm going lights out. Lights out. We got to get on the right-hand side. Still firing on me right now. Fire. Reload. Allen, get ammo up. Get up, try. This is Bravo 211 call. We are receiving small arms fire north of checkpoint 22 Alpha. They are scheduled to return home this May. continues on Frontline's website, where you can watch the full program again. And in the weeks ahead, follow how things are going for the men of Bad Voodoo. It takes time, and it takes a toll on you. Through new video they'll be sending to us. You know, take every day like it's your last. And... Folks at home, maybe they'll understand. As well as blog posts from them and producer Deborah Scranton. Plus, find out more about the making of this film. Take a peek inside the world of military bloggers and join the discussion at pbs.org. Everywhere we looked, it was take meds, take meds, take meds. Six million American children are taking psychiatric drugs. We have no idea how we got on as many meds as he was on. But most have not been tested on children. I don't know what the long-term side effects are going to be for him. Is this good medicine? or an uncontrolled experiment. Taking my medication makes me more like I'm supposed to be. The medicated child. To order Frontline's Bad Voodoo's War on DVD, call PBS Home Video at 1-800-PLAY-PBS or order online at shoppbs.com.